journey of faith and ultimately leading to the uh, the whole village coming to faith okay those stages of faith i want to look at it now from another angle from the clues we've had so far about jesus so i'm looking at page 40 in your book And I tell my students, read the gospel like a murder mystery. <laughs> an old-fashioned Agatha Christie murder mystery. Not modern mystery, but an old-fashioned one. Where you get everyone in an enclosed space. On a boat, on an island, on a train, on the uh, sixth floor of Broken Bay Institute. Right? <laughs> And a murder happens, so you know somebody in this enclosed space is a guilty party. And from then on, clues are given. So a light on, a muddy footprint, a diary found. <coughs> the Gospel writer is giving us clues as we read the text, guiding our reading. And as we read, we're meant to be alert to these clues and especially because we've read the prologue okay don't never forget that so just looking at the story we've got so far the first clue the word became flesh and tabernacled among us so that image of the place where god dwells in the old testament the tabernacle the second clue at Cana. The servants, the steward calls the bridegroom to congratulate him on the good wine. Now we know that in fact it was Jesus who provided the good wine. So when we put all that together, we, we know that in fact Jesus is now the bridegroom. And that's another image. Jesus is the bridegroom. The third clue. In the temple, when Jesus says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the writer says, he spoke of the temple of his body. Another clue as to Jesus' identity. Tabernacle, bridegroom, temple. And then the witness of John, speaking about himself as the friend of the bridegroom pointing again to Jesus as the bridegroom. So, we've got a pretty good idea now who Jesus is. All of those clues are going to be extremely important if we're to read John 4 sensibly. This is usually treated very poorly, I have to say. Okay, but let's read it now with the idea of who Jesus is in John's Gospel. So it begins. And I've got the text here, um, a good bit of it, so you can follow it. And sometimes I've translated it a little bit differently, trying to get what the Greeks say. He came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. <coughs> Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, weary as he was with his journey, sat down on the well. It was about the sixth hour. Now, a couple of things. We're told it was Jacob's well. In fact, we're told twice the name of Jacob. Now, if we were first century Jews, we'd know the Jacob story really, really well. And if we're not first century Jews, hopefully we'd say, uh oh, I'm meant to know it. <laughs> now, just to refresh you, I put it down the bottom of the page. So before we go any further, we're going to read the story behind this scene. Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. As he looked, he saw a well in the field. Now the stone on the well's mouth was large, 
And when all the flock were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone away from the mouth of the well and water the sheep. Jacob, uh, Jacob said to them, Do you know Laban, the son of Nabal? They said, We know him. See, Rachel, his daughter, is coming with the sheep. He said, Behold, it's high day. What time of day is that? It's middle of the day. No, right. It's not time for the animals to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go pasture them. Okay, that's the Jacob story. Now, let's go back to John chapter 4, where we are told it was about the sixth hour. What time's that? Yeah. Middle of the day. Right. So, John has this encounter between Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the same time of day that Jacob meets gorgeous Rachel. Now, think of some of the things you've heard about. Why this encounter takes place in the middle of the day. Why does a Samaritan woman come to the well in the middle of the day? Well, this is what I've heard. Because she's a fallen woman, because the, the normal time would be to come in the morning, but you know she can't come with the other women because of a bad marriage. You heard that sort of stuff? It's nonsense. Right? Just rub it out. Erase. Delete. The whole point of it being the middle of the day is because that's the time of Jacob's meeting. That's the point. It's got nothing to do with the woman's morality. It's because of behind this scene is the Jacob story. And we should know that because we've been told Jacob twice. Jacob gave this to his son and Jacob's well was there. Go and read the Jacob story. This is the same time of day. Now one other thing that I want to point out. It says Jesus sat on the well. Your text probably has by the well. <coughs> yeah, that's because mostly we think of wells like this. Here's a well. Here's the ground. Oops, there we go. Here's a well. A uh, little thing like that. Right, that's what we think wells look like. And so we probably imagine Jesus sitting here with his back up against it. Okay? That's not what wells look like in the Middle East. Wells in the Middle East are simply holes in the ground with a stone on them. That's what we've just had described in the Jacob story. Okay? One of the ones I saw, they used the top of a rubbish bin. Very effective. Nice and light. So what's Jesus doing? The text says he sat on the well. There he is. Now, why? Why do I rave about this? Think of the imagery. Jesus is the temple. We just heard that in chapter 2. One of the ideas in Judaism was that all the waters of creation, all the waters, came down from the throne of God, touched the earth, and then spread out. And they called that spot the earth's navel or belly button because it connects the earth to God. And that spot was the temple. So in their mythology, they saw the temple sitting upon or resting upon all the waters of creation. Now, if any of you have got my book yet, there's a picture of there's a picture of the belly button. Um, if I, anyone wants to hand it to me, I'll oh here and show you a picture. It's in Jerusalem. Uh, it's in the tomb of the Holy Sepulchre now. It's not, um, but they imagine it was in the there it is the earth's belly button. The navel, where heaven and earth meet. And that's 
the center of all the waters of creation, all the waters of life. You might remember the great story in Ezekiel of all the waters coming out of the side of the temple and making that enormous river. That's why. Because the temple sits above the place where all the waters of creation are gathered. Now John knows that. His audience, first century Jews, know that mythology. We don't. Right? We don't. So we miss some of this. But when you're reading the text, you know, Jesus sat on the well, this is its background. Jesus is the temple resting upon all the waters of creation. All the waters of creation. It's there in the symbol. Okay. He sat down, uh, it was about the sixth hour. And I've got a little explanation about that temple there in the middle of the page. Now the other thing to know is that in the Old Testament, if you had a man meeting a woman at a well, you know what's going to happen next. There's going to be a wedding. This is at what's called a type scene. Boy meets girl at the local. Okay, the local watering hole is the village well. And I've given you some examples here of passages in the Old Testament where a man meets, finds his wife at a well. So we have Abraham's servant finds a wife for Isaac by the well. We have Jacob, which we've just read, meeting his wife at a well. We have Joseph of Moses meeting his wife at a well. So now Jesus is at a well. <coughs> Our and, and by the way, he's the bridegroom. So what are we expecting? Marriage. A woman's going to come into the story. There's got to be a woman here. And the next verse tells us. The problem is it's a Samaritan woman. A woman of Samaria. Now don't be afraid. I'm not going to say Jesus runs off with the woman of Samaria. That's, we're talking at the level of symbol. A Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. And the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, and I'm going to say a Judean at this point, because I think that in fact is what's going on here. A woman of Samaria and a man from Judea. Now, a tiny bit of background. Oh, maybe I won't do that. Forget it. It's happening, is it? Oh, yes. I couldn't, I thought it went sideways. Right. Okay, a little bit of background. You've got the kingdom of David and Solomon. Right. In the time of Solomon's sons, that one kingdom was split into two. So we get what's called the divided kingdom. Ten tribes in the north, two little tribes in the south. It wasn't long before another great power, Assyria, pretty much where all the trouble's happening at the moment, okay? Uh, Syria came on the scene, and the year is about 721. Came and captured the Northern Kingdom. Now that Northern Kingdom, its capital city was <coughs> Samaria. Capital city? About there, Samaria. Now what the Assyrians did was they took the wealthy, the royal house, the educated, anyone who could be a troublemaker. In other words, everyone here. <laughs> they are all taken and dispersed in various other places that the Assyrians have captured. And into this area 
come people from all these other lands. So they mix up the population as a way of stopping any <coughs> uprising. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. yeah. But out of the mixture of the original Israelite people and these foreigners comes this group called the Samaritans. And that's why they were sort of looked down on by the Jews, not, uh, no, not purely of the line of Israel. So that's, that's that part. This little kingdom down here was called Judea. And it managed to survive for another couple of hundred years. Okay. So we get a woman from here and a man from here coming together, meeting at a well. Now let's keep reading. Jesus says to her, If only you knew the gift of God, who it is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, he would have given you living water. And the woman says, she takes him literally. Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. How are you going to get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Okay. Now, what's she talking about? Turn your page over. I need to introduce you to something you may not be aware of. When I was a kid, I'd go to Mass on Sunday and the Gospel would be read in Latin. Right. And then it was re-read yes, re in English. Much the same was happening in the land of Israel. The Scripture, the Old Testament would be read in Hebrew. But the people living in the land no longer spoke Hebrew. They spoke Aramaic. Related, but not the same. So they would have a reading from the Old Testament in Hebrew, followed by a reading that they could understand, the Aramaic. Now those readings are called the Targums. They were not an exact translation. They were a bit of an elaboration, you know, uh, trying to make it even more dramatic than the original. So up the top of page 42, this is how the meeting between Jacob and Rachel happened in the Targums. When our father Jacob raised the stone from above the mouth of the well, the well overflowed came up to its mouth. Hmm, get that. Jacob didn't need a bucket. The water came up to him. No bucket needed. And what's more, this water kept flowing for 20 years. So that's the normal synagogue reading in telling the Jacob story. Now, Let's look at what the woman says to Jesus again. Verse 11. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket. Are you greater? Where are you going to get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? See, in the back of her mind, she's got this story running. You know, that Jacob didn't need a, a bucket because he could do a miracle. And what's more, Jacob's miracle lasted for 20 years. Now, let's read, uh, continue and see what Jesus has to say. Jesus said in verse 13, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But the water that I will give, whoever drinks the water I will give, will never be thirsty. The water I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternity life. Okay. Jacob's miracle only lasted 20 years. Jesus' miracle is for eternity. Okay. So, reading this story against the background of how the Jacob story was told in the synagogue, this dialogue begins to make much more sense. 
And Jesus is being compared to the great ancestor Jacob. So, and why can Jesus offer living water? Because he's the temple that sits above the very wellspring of creation, the very wellspring of life. Now, let's see what happens now. The woman now de develops in her faith. She says, Sir, give me this water so I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here. And now we get, go call your husband and come back. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus says, good, you're right. In saying, oh, you have no husband. For you've had five and the one you have now is not your husband. Okay, how many husbands has she? Six. Good, six. Six. Remember the meaning of six? Yes. Not quite perfect. Who do you think is going to be the seventh? Yes. Right. She, she's there as the bridegroom. Alright? It's pointing ahead to what Jesus is doing. Now, <coughs> on your page 42, page 42, We have a passage, it's the second one from Ezekiel. Ezekiel's vision of the union of the southern and northern kingdoms. This uh, passage, written probably in the time of exile, is a passage that looks ahead to the time when God will bring those two divided kingdoms into one. So, he's told, Ezekiel's told. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, take a stick and write on it for Judah. I'll just get something from behind here. <coughs> there he is. There we go. Judah, the blue one. Then take another stick and write on it for Joseph and all the house of Israel. So that's Judah, that's the blue one, and that's Samaria. Okay, you've got representing the two kingdoms. Then join them together so that they can become one in your hand. And when your people say, will you not show us the meaning of this? Say to them, thus says the Lord, I'm about to take the stick of Joseph, that's the Samaritans, and the tribe of Israel associated with it, put them on the stick of Judah, make them one. And then say, thus says the Lord, I will take the people of Israel from the nations among which they have gone. I will gather them from every quarter. I'll bring them to their own land. I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. One king will be king over them. Never again will they be two nations. Never again will be they, they be divided. They shall be my people. I will be their God. My servant David will be king. They will have one shepherd. I will make a covenant of peace with them. And then look what's going to happen. When you finally have this united people, I will set my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place shall be with them. I will be their God. They will be my people. This passage, I think, lies behind the story of the meeting between a woman of Samaria and a man from Judea, a man who's already been introduced as the great divine bridegroom. And in that imagery of bridegroom, marriage, coming together, is the bringing together of Samaria and Judea, making them one. And when they are one, my dwelling place, my sanctuary. Well, isn't that who Jesus is? And at the end of this story in the Samaritan uh, village, it says many Samaritans came to believe because of a woman's testimony. And he dwelt there. You might have stayed, it's actually dwelt. 
remained or dwelt there two days. So you've got in a symbolic story the fulfillment of this vision. A vision of a future coming together of North and South, Samaritan and Jew. Quite probably there were Samaritans in the Joannine community. Now becoming one community, both Jews and Samaritans in one community. This new Jesus community and the promise that Jesus is dwelling in their midst as a living temple. So when we go beyond the literal, just what the words are about, and into some of the <coughs> Old Testament background, the images, images of marriages, boy meets girl at the local well, the story of Jacob meeting Rachel in the middle of the day, and that's what John has. Uh, of the, the, the mythology of the temple sitting above all the creative waters of life. And that's who Jesus is, that temple. That's why he can offer her life-giving waters, living waters. So, you know, we've got to sort of get down a little bit into the depths of illusion, symbol that would be known to Jewish first century people. We might know them because we're a bit removed from them, but first century audience I think would be very aware of these texts and these hopes that in the fullness of time Samaria and Judea would come together. So have a little buzz for a moment at your table and just see if that's making some sense. Okay, so I'm working with the, the deeper symbolism of the text. The symbol of the bridegroom. Uh, remembering at the background is the whole language of covenant, the, the, the covenant relationship between God and Israel, often described in terms of a marriage. And now in this scene, using you know, imagery associated with a marriage, a man and a woman coming together at a well, typical marriage scene. The coming together of Ezekiel's vision of North and Southern Kingdom and the, the covenant being renewed. My dwelling place will be the, with them. They will be my people, I will be their God. Covenant language. So I read it as a, as a very rich theological reflection really on the Joannine community. That this is now where that covenant is happening in the Joannine community when both Jews and Samaritans and Gentiles are part of this new people of God. People of God. So I offer it to you, I would, uh, it's worth reflecting on uh, some of that deeper imagery in the story and taking us beyond just the surface level, um, uh, but reading it against its Jewish background, right? And because that's what we miss out on. Okay, that's, that's where we miss it. Uh, and then can just get t t sort of stuck at the literal level. Okay. Yeah, Frank, good, thanks. What Mary has said. Frank, here, take this. Oh, come up to the mic. Okay. Is working? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, what Mary has uh, done with this is a, heart, is a very symbolic pen. Um, depends a lot on the background that she's used. I'd go back to what I said earlier about the magic pool which the infant can paddle and the professor can you can't hear? No. You yell louder? Yes. The lady in the corner saying she can't hear. So I would uh, I would insist that uh, you may not all 
buy into this high symbolic reading that Mary's given you, but I assure you, if you read this John 4 at the level of the paddling pool, end of the pool, it's still a great story about a faith journey. Okay, so don't get, don't get lost in the complexities of what may or may not be the background. Yeah, I'm taking you into deep water. <laughs>